Good evening, I'm Jeff Koinange, and this is Jeff Koinange Live. Tonight, you know, being Wednesday, it's all about politics as usual. Better yet, state of the nation. Better, better yet, if I was to put a topic for tonight's show, I would say, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. That's, of course, referring to the president's recent parastatal appointments that have got this country in a tizzy. What about the president's plane diverted while flying over Yemen? What was that about? Okoa, Kenya? Where is that going? Well, to help us sort out all this and much more, I'm joined finally by a woman. And it's not Kiraito Murungi's wife, as many of you may think, keep saying, keep insisting. She's actually the vice chair of the Kenya Human Rights Commission. She was the vice chair of the TJRC. She's also been on the board of the ICC's trust fund. Betty Murungi needs very little introduction. And she's the woman in the middle. On the far end, man knows the constitution back to front, front to back. He can quote chapters, articles, verses, you name it. Karanja Kabage is a constitutional lawyer and businessman. We're going to be discussing all these issues in the coming hour. Sit back. Our Twitter handles are at Karanja Kabage, at Betty Murungi, at Koinanga Jeff. The hashtag is JKL. It is time for JKL. Welcome to the show. Good to see you. Thank you for having me back on the bench. A lot of women have been complaining that I don't, I don't have enough women on the shows. Did One you? in particular called... Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Atieno Thorne or something. Mm -hmm. Don't you know any women that you can have on the bench? I know you. Oh, you need to know more than just me. Okay, you'll introduce me. <laughs> I'll think about <laughs> it. <laughs> Betsy, that's cold. <laughs> KK, help me here. All right, let's go straight to the appointments. Your <laughs> thoughts, KK. KK, let me start with you. These <laughs> parastatal appointments, why are people getting their knickers in a twist over this? What's the big deal? <laughs> That's a good one, <laughs> Jeff. Well, first, it's nice to see you, Betty. Yes, it's lovely. Great. I haven't seen you for so long, and uh, it's, it's not very good. I've been in the South Sudan. Oh, helping everybody. Yeah, as well. usual. Yeah. Guys, we have a show. Eh? We have a show. Anyhow, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the issues that Kenyans are raising, uh, to me, sometimes I find them quite mundane. That uh, one who has not been appointed, who has been appointed. The critical issue to me is this. Do we need all these parastatal institutions or state-owned enterprises? What are the purposes for them? Because once you know what the purpose of these institutions are, then you can look at them and say, yes, probably we don't have the right person or we have the right person. Okay, okay, the president cut them down drastically. I think he reduced them to 79 or something. Yes. I mean, that's... Well, well, you can see even reduce them further. Because, you see, majority of them, you need to do cost-benefit analysis. For me, economics matters a lot. Why do we have some of these institutions? That's the first thing. It's not who is appointed, who is not appointed. Because Kenyans tend to become very, very ethnic in their orientation. Yeah. They don't look at the competencies mm -hmm. and the skills of the people appointed. Absolutely. All they are interested in is, oh, there is no gender, yeah. there is no youth, yeah. there is no um, a person from my area, and so yeah. forth and so forth. Those are really basic mm. things. Betty, your thoughts? Um, I think we, the starting point of looking at these appointments is looking at the framework within which they have been made. Um, as soon as uh, this government uh, took power in 2013, a task force was appointed to rationalize parastatals in this country. And that task force was headed by Abdi Kadir, who is a special advisor For constitutional <coughs> to the president yeah. on constitutional and right. legal affairs. Yeah. Now, that task force came up with a report in November of 2013, which made wide range uh, of uh, recommendations. Amongst these recommendations was the reduction in number of the parastatals, um, the rationalizations uh, of most of them, um, and it also made recommendations about uh, who would serve on the boards 
how, you know, what the criteria would be, how they would be appointed, and so on. Uh, most importantly, that report of Abdi Kader uh, recommended that they would uh, establish an entity, a law, uh, that would uh, bring into force something called government-owned entities. The law is known as the Government-Owned Entities Bill. It's still pending in Parliament. Charles Nyachai's um, CIC uh, uh, you know, has brought the bill for discussion last year in May, exactly a year ago, and invited public participation about that bill. So we, we are still stuck at that point where we don't have the government um, owned entities uh, bill because what that law sought to do was to establish a kind of super body that would control all the government owned entities. There would be uh, state corporations, um, uh, parastatals and uh, agencies. So it was going to take care of all of those government owned entities. So we should be asking, the questions we should be asking is have these people been appointed pursuant to the proposed government-owned entities law. Clearly they have not been because the law is not yet in place. Okay. So under what law have they been appointed? They have been appointed uh, under the old law and so therefore the much touted transformation um, of uh, government uh, agencies and government parastatals and government-owned entities is not happening. The criteria that was set in this government-owned entities bill and in the Abdikadir's report is very clear. People who are appointed to boards, like uh, Kabage has said, need to have some uh, skills and expertise in corporate governance. So those are the first questions we should be asking about these people that have been appointed. The other consideration about, oh, they are all from, you know, your neck of the woods. Yeah or you know, Kabaga's neck of the woods, yeah. or I saw Meru's complaining that there are only six Meru's right. that have been appointed. Right. And no chairman. I mean, I mean how, come, how many Trukanas have been appointed, for example? How many um, you know, um, coastal people have been appointed to this thing? So that's, that's not that we're asking the wrong questions. <clears throat> Absolutely, I, I agree. Okay, so KK, when you, when you think of some of the names and the, the biggest complaints, and you know, it's been on Twitter and Facebook and all social media the last couple of days, the biggest complaint is a lot of young people have been left out. But I don't think that's the case. There are quite a few young people in that list. In fact, several, dozens maybe, <coughs> of young people. But the ones that jump out at you are the Musikari Combos, the Julia Sumkulis, Kalempendile. Is it? Uh, first of all, let's look at the institutional framework, mm. uh, the legal, the regulatory and institutional framework under which these appointments have been made. For one, we have what is called State Corporations Act, CAP 446. That act, it has not been repealed. It is the one, in my opinion, as a legal instrument that has been used by the President. I look I've had uh, the, the, the Senate, particularly the chairman of the Finance Committee, uh, say that uh, there was a regulation in Parliament or in the Senate that was supposed to be passed by Parliament. But remember, they are saying it has not been passed by the Senate. But it is timelines, because it was sub submitted in Parliament or in the Senate on the 7th, and they have 15 days within which they must say yes or no. Normally, it's a, a, an instrument that allows the parliament to look at those regulations. Now, for me, as far as the legality of appointment is concerned, unless somebody can bring out a much more substantive issue, I think they are legally appointed. But And they've been gazetted, haven't they? And they've been gazetted. But the issue which I really would like to debunk in the mind of fellow Kenyans is the age issue. Mm. And I'm going to mm -hmm. go to, uh, let me do a landscaping, for example. Let's take the case of the U.S. If you look at the U.S. cabinet, there are 16 in number. The oldest is Joe Biden, the vice president. The second oldest is John Kerry, as the Secretary of State. On average, they are 61.5 years old. Average. That is the U.S. average. Let's go to China. There are 39 uh, cabinet ministers in China. 
the average age is 63.5%, yes. Let's go to Singapore. There are 15 cabinet secretaries or cabinet ministers. The average age is 57. Give me an African example. Why, why have I, just a minute, why have I picked these three? Mm. For a very good reason. The U.S. is the biggest economy in this world. China is the second biggest economy. And Singapore, for your information, is really a star as far as management of resources is concerned. The age factor there seems to indicate there is a gem in this appointment. Can you go further? Let's speak uh, uh, Australia with 19 cabinet secretaries or uh, ministers. The average age is 53. UK with 22 cabinet ministers, it is 51. Average age. So what do you yeah. tell the now, young people out there? What I want to tell them, the thing is, is, it's one thing to, let me tell you one thing. Experience has no substitute. Don't be under any illusion that we can do something, we can leapfrog, as Kenyans want to think, with this, in terms of age. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't have very bright and very capable young people. They're there, and we must give them opportunities. But the reason why I've cited those countries, Obama is about 53 years old. And look at the age of the people he has appointed. Look at Lee Sun Long, who is the prime minister, and the kind of people he has appointed. Look at the Chinese, they are, the Chinese, they are in their 60s. Yeah. But did you agree? Uh, you no, agree? Uh, well, but let me just finish uh, my, my point here. We will have to bring in young people. And I totally agree with that. But you must brand the young mm, and, the old. and the old because experience has a lot to do. I have been personally privileged to have served in a number of uh, these boards. I can give you an example. I was the first chairman of CCK. Now, I had three, I had 11 board members, four permanent secretaries, and the others were brilliant. But when I look at the kind of decisions we made during that time, and the men and women who are serving that board, we did a pretty good job. I can assure you that. What was the average age? The average age, as far as I'm concerned, was about 52 or 53. Mm -hmm. That time, it's 1999 that I'm talking oh. about. Betty, your thoughts? You disagree with him? Um, in part, because I think we have to look at the demographics <coughs> of the country. Kenya is a young country. Having said that, it is important to look at the criteria and the recommendations. When you're appointed to serve on a board, <clears throat> you could be 100 years old for all I care, but as long as you fit the criteria, as long as you're able to um, you know, carry out the responsibilities that are assigned by that board, and that report of Abdikadir sets out guidelines which have been um, adopted by OECD and by many, many other countries, even including South Africa um, and other countries in our region, mm. in the African region, that have said that we will adopt uh, some set of rules yeah. uh, in reference to corporate governance that, that make sure that boards that are appointed are able to do their work. Now, KK is, is obviously speaking at a, a different level, and he's talking about cabinet appointments and so on. It's a good thing. I think experience, you, there's no substitute, as he says, for experience. But there's also no substitute for competence. Age does not Con confer uh, competence. Agree. You know, so to that extent, I have to disagree with him. Uh, the other important criteria, I think, which was set out um, and proposed in the government-owned um, entities bill was compliance with um, chapter 6. I know we don't pay much attention to mm. chapter 6 anymore. Uh, in fact, we pay very little attention to the Constitution yeah. anymore. Yeah. But one of, the, uh, one of the questions yeah. that must be asked of all of these appointments is do they, in fact, comply with chapter 6? And I think once we answer those questions, then we can go into these other things about equity uh, in appointments. Uh, but of course, people you know, are feeling aggrieved because perhaps they were expecting, I don't know what it is that they are expecting because 
um, you know, out they were expected to be appointed. I'll yeah. say that they were expected okay. to be appointed. And look, I started off this show by saying you're damned if you do, and you're, you're damned, damned if you don't. don't. Yeah. And you know, our president, you know, no matter what he does, he'll get slammed. He'll get slammed each and every way possible because people just wouldn't be satisfied with anything he does. Let's just face it. I think one of the other things that we need to address in this country, we have a mentality of entitlement. A very serious uh, problem, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Now, what we should be concerned about in this country, and this is a very serious issue, is the capacity to produce goods and services. For example, if you appoint anybody, whatever the age that you appoint in an institution, what I'm looking for is at the end of the day, when I do bottom lining, what impact are you having in that institution to which you have been appointed? Okay, we're going to take a break in a yeah. short moment, but in a, in a word, KK, in a word, good appointments or bad appointments? Just tell us your thoughts. You've seen the 300 names or so. Real quick. Well, I, I think, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, you can always find some good ones. I can give you one example, Go on. which I think is very good. Uh, the appointment of James, James Degua yeah, to, to the Capital Markets, Capital Markets Authority, yeah, that's brilliant. Okay. Uh, Richard that. Leakey, KWS. Richard Leakey uh, at KWS, uh, hopefully he will be able to be the least Richard Leakey that I know. Mm. And there are others. Betty, few, your thoughts? You know. Any good ones? Any bad ones? Uh, well, I think the entire thing is underwhelming. Underwhelming? You asked for one word? Underwhelming? James Degua and that type? Well, Three out of three hundred. Peter Kinua, your fellow Meru. Wow, I should be jumping on <laughs> the bench. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that they're, they're, they're Ted John Gumi is a good yes, choice. Yes, yes. Gladys Mboya. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a couple of those, but they're yeah. not more than ten. So I, I will still use the word underwhelming. Oh, you know, you people are such sour grapes because you didn't get appointments. <laughs> let's talk. Okay, let's switch gears when we come back from the break. Yeah. Let's talk about the list of shame. Your husband's on it. Yes, he is. Oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> at Betty Murugi, at Karanji Kabage, at Koinanga Jeff. Wow, it's getting pretty hot out here. List of shame coming up. And also, Okoa, Kenya. And the president's plane. Let's not forget the president's plane. Who was flying that aircraft? We'll find out. <laughs> JKL takes a break. We'll be back in a moment.